get blown by the Whirlwind FX Vortex, making gaming cooler and feeling the fire of a flamethrower sound like really great things. And that's why the Whirlwind FX Vortex is uh, one of the line item expenses for our books for the year. So the Vortex, we got for about 80 bucks. It, it launched a while ago, but now it's on sale. And we can't imagine why. So we're reviewing it today. This thing is supposed to blow hot air at you or cold air and big air quotes there as you're playing games based on the heat signature of what's on the screen, i.e. pixel values. So we're gonna be testing this thing today. We have benchmarks of the power consumption, noise levels, and some actual real world gaming experience. Also, we disassembled it to try and understand better how it works and what's inside of this large shell. So I guess it's, I guess it's time to get blown by the vortex. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Team Group Delta Max SSD. The Delta Max SSD has a mirror-like finish and addressable RGB LEDs to produce a large display area that's addressable by USB 2 or RGB cables. The Team Delta Max SSD is available in 250GB, 500GB, and 1TB capacities, capable of 560MB per second read and 500MB per second write speeds, or about 90K IOPS read and 80K for write. The Delta Max SSD is compatible with ASUS, Gigabyte, ASRock, and MSI RGB software for quick synchronization with the rest of the system. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this is it. This is the Vortex. The company is... I think technically called Whirlwind FX or Whirlwind VR was one of their initial earlier uh, phrases they used. And it's supposed to just be a directable, I mean, it's got a, a big blower fan in the back of it. So this is very similar to what you'd find on a stock GPU cooler, for example, like an AMD or Nvidia cooler, except if either company used one of these, it might actually cool well. This is maybe appropriate for like a GTX 480 or something like that. So there's a big blower fan in the back. Air goes into it. There's a heating element inside. When we take it apart, you'll see that. The air obviously gets directed out towards you. There's a flap inside that opens and closes with a stepper motor based on what the Vortex plus its software thinks needs to happen. And the goal of this company's product is to increase the immersion, as they say it. And that's supposed to be done by adding a, also their words, fourth dimension, which is wind, of... Uh, gaming peripherals, your suite. So you, you're supposed to position this about a meter away from you, if you have that desk space, about three, three and a half feet, and uh, direct it towards your face, and then you'll feel either hot air or ambient temperature air as your game flashes different colors in the game. Uh, it'll try and pick what temperature air you should feel, and then that hits you in the face, and that's what's supposed to increase the immersion. So let's get into it. We'll talk about... Uh, just about everything with this thing today and get get Patrick on screen for a bit to go through some of the gaming demos and the actual experiential side of the Whirlwind Vortex, which again, about $80 for this one was on sale. I think it's supposed to be 120 new and they do recommend two of them, but that was stretching the budget. So we went with one. We probably need to better explain what this thing is, or maybe not. Based on all the ads we've had popping up after researching the Vortex, there's an ongoing AdSense and Facebook ads campaign that may have already exposed you to the device. The Vortex website says that, quote, the Vortex is the world's first environmental simulator for PC gaming. That's arguable for a number of reasons, chiefly the loose definition of what environmental simulation means. But we'll challenge that arcades have had fans heaters, water sprayers, and all manner of other early VR effects that did what the Vortex wants to do, sometimes even more than that. So it's not a new idea, but to be fair, the Vortex does specify PC gaming, which probably is needed because I distinctly remember playing games in arcades back in the 90s that had wind effects, like the old rafting game that was in every bowling alley in America, or the early Jurassic Park arcade booths that blasted wind at you when the T-Rex invariably tried to eat you. PC gaming has also had all kinds of weird peripherals, though. The late 90s had a Titan Sphere by SGRL, for instance, that was one of the weirder ones. There was the OCZ Neural Impulse Actuator, a technology Der Bauer recently showed on his channel, but neither of these is an environmental simulator. You could argue that the Digisense Eye Smell Yes, that was the actual name, which attempted to launch in 1999 and did raise $20 million, was an earlier environmental simulator than the Vortex. This thing, as stupid as it was, was supposed to contain oils that could be mixed to create various smells live. 
As sad as we are that it never hit the market and so we'll never be able to smell the internet or its front page, we've been to enough gaming conventions to have a pretty good idea of what Reddit would smell like anyway. The Vortex, for all of its wind and heat-based marketing, does too offer the benefit of allowing you to smell gaming. If you've ever had the joy of smelling the magic smoke from a video card which releases its magic juice as a puff of smoke and a distinct electrical smell when an SMD blows up, then you can experience that smell every time you turn the Vortex on. But we should save this discussion for the gaming experience section later. The Vortex also advertises that it analyzes audio to trigger heat or wind using specifically the word cool to describe the inverse to heat. Technically, if I can be the actually guy for a minute, it's not cold air, it's ambient air at room temperature because the Vortex doesn't have a compressor or Freon in it to make cold air. Further marketing indicates, quote, heat signature analysis of the screen to determine what kind of air should be blown at any given time. For the most part, though, the dictation of when the fan turns on and off is done by what Vortex calls, quote, spectral density categorization, harmonic analysis, and other crafty tricks. Ran out of marketing words at the end there. So this is a fancy way to say how much noise is happening at a given time. Enough regurgitating the website, though. Before we get into power, noise, and thermal testing, and the 1,000-watt peak power consumption, we probably should talk about how this thing actually works, and maybe a bit about the gaming experience in the back half of this content as well. It's really simple. It's got four screws on the bottom, and then four screws in the back, and based on where the shell kind of meets, it looks like it'll just pull away and reveal the insides. Then, hopefully, if we can get it working open, the plan is to run it on the system with some games and see if we can actually see how the fan is reacting and how the flap is opening for the airflow, stuff like that. So let's take it apart, pretty straightforward. Uh, I guess we'll start with the four screws on the bottom. Pretty straightforward. So we've got a shell and the front side does have that button on it, the dial on the button right here which is hooked up via just a uh, data and power cable to a patch board. So this PCB on the bottom is a patch board. So there's the blower fan. That, uh, it's got some rolling resistance too. There's some friction on that. But giant blower fan, you've got the coil on top holding it down. Uh, that's pulling air. It's, so first of all, keep in mind there's a shell around this and there's gonna be some air just in the box. You get air pulled through the backside, through that grill. And then in here, there's a flap that'll open and close to move air through the output, theoretically based on whatever the software is telling it to do. And then you can see they've got warnings printed on the PCB. Let's try and show this too. It says, uh, warning protection from fire or protection against fire, replace only with same type. There might be some more hardware in here, but we don't want to pull this apart yet because we want to do some demos with it first and I uh, don't want to interfere too much with how it works. So what I'm going to do for now is socket this back in. And the heating hardware is probably in here. This looks like a power board, uh, similar to the power boards you would find on a TV or something. Not sure if this is responsible for any of the heat, but likely there's some more hardware in here. So let's get this back mounted, test it out, and then uh, we can do some more teardown potentially after that. But I think it will work just like this for the demos. So we've got it torn down now and it's exposed so we can actually see what's going on with it. I have Patrick joining me for this to help do some of the demos while we talk about what's going on. The one thing I want to point out as well is uh, we're going to use a physical tachometer and look at the fan speed. We stuck a shiny piece of sticker paper on the blower fan and uh, let's demo that first, I guess. Okay. So we'll talk about how it's all working after we get this demo in. So 11,000 RPM at the highest. This is manually controlled. If we do some actual demos, it, it might change a bit, but that's the top end of what the fan can do. So if you think of a four or 5,000 RPM NVIDIA or AMD reference blower fan, this is gonna be about twice the speed. Just to embarrass me. So what do we what do we think that's coming from? This is a step motor back here. Yeah, so there's a stepper motor that controls the um, flap. The, the flap. Um, 
that redirects air in the heating element or under the heating element. Um, right. And we think that's what's making the, it sounds like coil wine. It yeah. might be coil wine, but we think it's maybe the stepper motor that's making that constant not kind touch of. touch any exposed all right, wires. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how safe this is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's a, a motor on the back that might be that. And then Andrew noticed earlier that the LEDs pulsing when there's no other noise does make a bit of a whine. So that might be coil whine. And then you spotted a thermistor in here. Mm -hmm. So a thermistor is like, uh, EVGA uses them on their ICX cards. They use nine thermistors. It's just a thermal sensor. So there's one of those in there touching the plastic, Yeah. which probably the least useful place to put a thermistor for temperature measurements. There, there is a temperature readout in the oh, yeah, software, um, but we've speculated that that may or may not be accurate. It seems like- It's also very difficult to read, even not with the camera. It says 126 degrees right now. I mean, we're, we're gonna assume that's Fahrenheit and not Celsius. Um, yeah, otherwise it'd it, be ridiculous. Yeah, the meter's only half full right now, but um, <laughs> it doesn't seem to drop when the fan kicks up. Um, so, and if this is the thermistor that they're reading off of, it's only contacting this plastic. plastic. And I mean, yeah. Steve won't let me touch it, but it, it's not <laughs> 126 degrees. No, in. it's... Well, maybe Fahrenheit. <laughs> maybe Fahrenheit. Yeah. Let me see. Nope. 52 Celsius. Well, this says 163 degrees Fahrenheit. So a couple things here. Our understanding is that the color on the screen is what dictates the thermal swings. So color, it's looking for like red or blue or orange, stuff like that. And you can see there's a sensor here from their software. It's got 30 big pixels, basically. Uh, you could do a color dete value detection on the pixels to get that readout. They've grouped them into 30 units. And the thing is, you, you'll notice that it's not accurate right now. It's not updating at all. So as Patrick drags the window, we can change it maybe orange or green or whatever. And it's not updating. That's because there's no sound. So this thing reacts to sound. Let's get like no, just anything. Demo video in the background. Yeah, so this is now playing a, a YouTube video. You don't actually need a game to get this thing working. And uh, you might hear the fan pick up every now and then. It does some motion detection too. So if you move it around kind of quickly while there's sufficient sound in the background, it will blow the fan. Makes some very encouraging movements when the uh, housing is off too. Yeah, actually, if you watch the unit, you'll see it shaking around. So that's how it works. So the audio is supposed to be a smart way to prevent it from doing anything when you're just on desktop, maybe working, maybe working Premiere, Photoshop, whatever. Unfortunately, the reality is you would just want to turn this thing off if you're not intending to use it actively. Because if you listen to music while you work, you listen to podcasts or you're editing videos, it's going to react based on the intensity of that sound. The fan will spin up faster or slower based on that sound intensity. And then the heat will change based on the color on the screen. So if you're editing a video of gameplay footage and you run into some big fire sequence, it'll be hotter and then it'll blast air at you intermittently as you play the audio back. Let's, let's look at something more positive. So let's open Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So in this scene with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it does actually kind of blend in. You've got the loud jet engine sound of the vortex being blended in with the loud jet engine sound in the game. So it's not as noticeable. It does kind of fit with the immersion and it blows at the appropriate times. So this is a better instance where it's actually doing what the creators probably intended it to do. Uh, it is ambient temperature air because there's no red on the screen, but it does make sense to feel some wind in this scenario. So this actually does make sense, one of the better ones. So there's your background noise. You can, hopefully you can hear that picking up, but it's spinning pretty fast right now. There we go. And uh, we also, I think we have turbo mode right now on. Without turbo mode, I should note, it doesn't really work that well. You don't feel very much. So now we're launching Strange Brigade. The point of this test will be to show that it works in multiple APIs because we actually didn't think it would. As for turbo mode, Vortex claims that amplifies the behavior by about 10x, whatever that specifically means, we're not sure, but it does increase the, the frequency of the power spikes, which you'll see in our power charts. So it goes up to 1,000 watts more frequently, and then 
it'll it'll just kind of behave a lot more erratically too. So you'll see that in the charts, it's less predictable. But here's Strange Brigade, we're in Vulcan. And again, we're kind of starting on the more positive side despite the criticisms I'm peppering in here because you really shouldn't be buying this product for the most part to be frank. But <laughs> just get that out of the way first. I don't think you should buy this. But on the upsides, uh, it does work in Vulcan. It works in DX12 and it works in DX11 not just YouTube videos. So we didn't think that would be true, but it is. And the big thing though, is if you listen to when it's spinning up as I'm talking versus what's happening on the screen, it doesn't really make sense. So it's spinning based on motion detection, but there's no reason that this amount of wind would make sense in this game with this motion. You'll get some heat with that fire. When that fire was on the screen, there was heat, but it's latent heat. So you don't feel it till after the fire is exiting the screen because it takes a second for the vortex to start heating up and actually generate that heat. So by the time the explosion's happened, it's already gone by the time uh, when you feel the heat from the unit. And then for uh, audio is really the big dictator of what's happening. It's the governor of a lot of the behavior. That benchmark's playing some music. So you'll get some spikes and in intensity based on that. It's funny to, okay. All right, so this one, I liked this demo. This is F1 2018, and I'm showing this because it's one of the places where, from an immersion standpoint, this makes sense. With planes, like a flight simulator, you'd think that the idea of having the wind react to the plane motion kind of makes sense, except you normally have a windshield and a cockpit. So unless you're like Wilbur Wright at Kitty Hawk, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to have a, a plane like actually feel the airflow. This it kind of does. You've got a visor and a helmet, but uh, it is an exposed cockpit for F1 2018s, F1 cars. So it's getting some reaction. And at first, the first 10 seconds or so of looking at this, I was genuinely impressed until uh, the charade started falling apart. So the problem is it's reacting to noise from the game right now. And it reacts to the uh, the mean, like the average noise, and excursions from the mean will create spikes where it blows a lot harder. Whereas the uh, when you're kind of peaking at a high RPM, so as the engine maxes out at 11,000 RPM in this case, and starts just running up against the RPM limiter, and you're at 300 kilometers per hour, uh, it stops. It stops blowing at all because there's it's now below the mean. But as you accelerate, like you're shifting gears a lot or there's a crash or there's other vehicles nearby, it'll blow the wind harder. So the problem is you could be driving on a straightaway with no cars near you, so there's less noise against the mean and the uh, fan will not blow at all. But then when you have cars near you and you're going from neutral to one or one to two, it'll get a lot louder. You can see here at seven, 300 kilometers per hour, it wasn't blowing at all for, for your seven, uh, but now we're turning, shifting gears a lot near other vehicles and it goes, but yeah, end result is it's completely sporadic and not really an immersive experience. It just becomes unpleasant and annoying because you're sitting with this thing blowing at your face and you just get gusts of electrical smell, like that, that space heater in the winter smell hitting you in the face with sometimes it's hot and sometimes it's ambient temperature. It doesn't make sense for hot air to really be hitting you with this. So that's kind of the, one of the better experiences and it's still not that great. Time to get into some data here. Other than the incessant on-off gust of wind, the next most noticeable byproduct of the whirlwind vortex is its noise. We mounted our dB meter to a tripod at about head height at a distance of three and a half feet or about one meter, as recommended by the vortex for optimal distance for use. The dB meter and the vortex were angled in a way that the air wasn't directly hitting the noise receptacle on the sound receptacle on the dB meter, as this would invalidate the results with all the crosswind causing higher noise levels than actual reality. Ears aren't exactly the same as a mic anyway. So we pointed the meter at the vortex, but in a way that wasn't in the direct air path. Here's the noise over time plot. Running with turbo mode on the vortex disabled, the default configuration, we measured noise levels during the benchmark as between about 29 dBA, noise floor was about 28 during this test, and about 47 dBA at the high end. There's no real average during this run, as it's constantly up and down depending on what's going on on the screen. From a human factor standpoint, inconsistent noise is the most noticeable type of noise, as it's never able to blend into the background. 
the ear doesn't become accustomed to the variable noise, and so without overpowering headphones, you'll be joined by a noisy blower fan when gaming. Those who prefer speakers will have difficulty battling the added noise, but a headset makes it easier. During the scenes where the Vortex thought it detected action, not always accurate, mind you, we observed a sustained noise level of approximately 42 to 43 dBA in a noise floor with everything off of about 28. Plotting the turbo mode next, offering a more vigorous heater and fan profile, the difference becomes clear. Turbo mode blows away the previous result, measuring now about 10 dBA higher on average. Thanks to the logarithmic scale, in terms of human perception, the human ear will subjectively, mind you, perceive about a 10 dBA increase as about a 2x increase in apparent or perceived noise to the listener. This isn't the same as acoustic power, but it's instead a statement on the more subjective perceived noise. Either way, an average 10 dBA increase is massive and puts this device at about the same noise levels as a 100% RPM blower fan on a reference card at similar distances. Granted, it is a blower fan, and it's probably at max RPM during turbo mode. Not too surprising then. Because our benchmark used a video playback from Vortex's own demo, we were able to synchronize our testing almost perfectly from one pass to the next. The behavior, though, is not perfectly consistent, as betrayed by the spiky behavior toward the 500 second mark. But it's close. Even if you have enough space to distance the Vortex a full meter away, the noise is likely a major consideration for most users. You'll be turning the headset up to combat this. Power consumption is next. If we start with turbo disabled and use this device as its configured stock, but also with the chart scale of only 0 to 50 watts, things look sort of acceptable and normal. We had to set this artificially constrained scale to illustrate the lower end, but we'll expand it later to reveal what those spikes are really hitting. Ignoring the spikes, the Vortex sits at about 5 watts idle, with spikes between 10 watts and 30 watts, typically closer to 15 watts when running our video playback benchmark. There are almost more spikes above the scale than those between 10 watts and 30 watts, though, so time to expand the scale. Here's what the chart really looks like for turbo off. We validated this with multiple power logging devices, by the way, because it didn't look believable at first. With turbo off set to normal usage, we observed spikes over 1,000 watts at times, with additional spikes upwards of 600 to 800 watts. For this small device, that's an impressive, scary amount of power. It's a heating element inside of a plastic shell that can spike up to 1,000 watts, which explains why the angleable output for the air is a, a more fire or melt resistant plastic. Enabling turbo mode with the Vortex demo gets significantly more aggressive, but still isn't as bad as some of the other games. For this mode, we see power consumption spikes more often at about three to four times the frequency of the original results. During the middle, we see a drawn out step down from 1000 watts to about 200 watts, lasting over a 30 second period. And in some other games, it'll sit pegged at 1000 watts for a longer period of time. We're back in the other set now. There's a lot more we could show with this device. And originally it was a content piece that I had pretty heavily scripted, but we ended up deciding to do it on camera because it's the whole point of it is that it's an experiential peripheral. And to really get the full effect of how the fan ramps up and down and responds to stuff on the screen, it really made more sense to just record it live because then you get the fan ambient noise so you could better appreciate when it's ramping and not. And that was with turbo mode on, so you pick it up on the audio better. Turbo mode off doesn't really, so the device has a recommended distance of one meter. And at one meter, about three and a half feet by their definition in the guide, you don't really feel very much with turbo mode off. With turbo mode on, you definitely feel it and hear it a lot more, but it's almost too much. So there needs to be more of a mid-step. And the heat is also, it's not, <sighs> It's enough where if you close the door to the room and you didn't have AC running, it would absolutely increase the room ambient for sure. I mean, it's just the heat, the power goes somewhere and it's gonna be heat. So that's a consideration for some people. Also, the heat isn't necessarily anything other than just unpleasant because a lot of the time it doesn't really match what's on screen. Anthem and Battlefield 5 work exceptionally well compared to the rest of the games. And it seems like the developers tuned the software for those two games, which is it's really sort of unfortunate Anthem's in there because it was such a failure on PC. But it works a lot better in those two. It doesn't really work that well in a lot of other stuff. It's just kind of guessing, and it's normally inaccurate. As you saw with F1, it's all over the place. It, it doesn't really make any sense. We did take the rest of the device apart, and we have some better understanding of how it works now. So the 
power board I pointed out earlier doesn't have to, we don't think it generates the heat, it's just a power supply. It looks again sort of like what you'd find on the back of a TV. And uh, that power board handles the, the power for the device, this handles the heat. So it's a fairly dense uh, heat thermal solution. You have a set of fins and then you have what we think are ceramic uh, wafers in between. And this looks like it's where you're gonna get the power for the heat generation. There's a thermistor, that's it right there for detecting the temperature. And then there's what we think is a fuse. It is labeled 250 volt. And there is supposed to be a fuse that blows if you plug it into a European wall outlet, something where it's more than 120 volts US outlet. So there's some engineering here for thermal precautions and for power precautions, which is good because it's basically a space heater and you don't want a cheap space heater that could potentially turn into a fire hazard or something. So we don't, it, they try to take some precautions. Now, a thousand watts is still a lot and we should take a second to appreciate how small of a device it is, the power board specifically, for the amount of power you're pulling through it under a heavy load. And we did some simulation scenarios where, for example, I launched uh, a music video just it's architects, it's metal, lots of noise constantly. And the fan ramps super hard during that where it's just nonstop barrage of noise. And then the uh, on screen, instead of playing the video, we played back some scenes with a lot of fire in it or played back games like Anthem. And what you end up with is just getting bombarded with heat at a bit of a latency beyond the ex past the explosion period because it takes a second to heat up. But you'll see that the power level does sustain between maybe 400, 600 watts for the more intense uh, scenes where the, the software thinks that it should be producing a lot of heat. So you do get some sustained load, even though in our initial benchmark, which uses Anthem with actually Vortex's demo that they've uploaded, in that one, it spikes to 1,000 and comes back down. But in, uh, you can generate sustained load scenarios at 400, 600 watts with uh, some different gameplay videos that have a bit more firefights going on, stuff like that. So anyway, a lot of power for this device. And um, that's, I mean, it's one consideration would be how much current can your circuit handle? And if you're using this in a house, you probably have one circuit in that room if it's a bedroom and it might be a 15 amp circuit, 120 volts AC, you plug in this device, the Vortex Plus, a high-end gaming computer, you're over your, your power budget, your current budget for the wall. So at that point, it's just a matter of, is it heating up long enough to trip the breaker? And if it's just spiking to 1,000 coming down, it might not be, but it can sustain. And so you should keep that in mind. You might not be able to really use this in, at, at its uh, fullest capabilities if you have a 15 amp limit with a fairly high power consuming PC and it's all under load at once. But ultimately we don't think you should really buy this device. It seems like a fine experiment in engineering, but the software is just not good enough and the immersion isn't really, it's not really immersion, it's just an annoyance a lot of the time. So from an experiential standpoint, we can't recommend it. And uh, that's all we really have to say about it. Interesting idea though, and probably one which could be improved upon, certainly more than the eye smell, which was supposed to launch in 2000. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to support efforts like this directly, like picking up one of our toolkits or mod mats that we both used uh, in this video. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out there as well. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.